Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight we are discussing um, a personal favorite of yours, uh, one that has a uh, particular significance for the two of us uh, in some sense, and um, uh, frankly a grossly underrated uh, philosophical film. Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. We're visiting Punxsutawney once again. So, um, as we normally do right off the bat, uh, we'll give everybody some context. But uh, what is our relationship to this film? Well, I actually saw it in the movie theaters years ago. And when it was released, because I was a big Bill Murray fan fan and Harold Ramis fan who directed it after having watched Harold Ramis on Second City TV out of Toronto and then uh, watching him co-star with Bill Murray in the movie Stripes. So I do have one question. Wouldn't mom have been um, pregnant with Allison and uh, and or like she was like very, very small and I was three how did you uh, manage that? I would have thought we would have probably left you with Ron and Barb, and we went to the movie theater. I see. Interesting. Okay. That would be, I can't remember specifically, but that was a common thing. I see. Well, I'm thinking more of, and honestly, I didn't see this movie, like, uh, the full movie uh, until probably, oh, gosh my junior year of high school. But even before that, we had been playing it, you know, partially and on loops. And so I didn't necessarily know the movie other than in small clips here and there. But during our um, annual Groundhog Day party that we used to have. Yes, we had a Groundhog Day party two years in a row. Then we missed a year. Then we had it the next year. And it got to be so big and so overwhelming, your mother was about to have a stroke. So we So stopped. just like everything else that she tries to take on. So um, I'm not going there. It's just it got to be <laughs> too big. I mean, we had 450 people in our house. One, the, the okay, third. then I grossly underestimated how many people were at that thing. Okay. No, we, we counted. I mean, they weren't all there at the same time, but there were there were close. Yeah, because there wouldn't have been enough space. Yeah, they we had we they were coming in waves. Um, we went through two entire uh, Nesco roasters of um, uh, what the 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 turkey sandwich stuff. Oh that yeah, mom's famous turkey sandwiches. Yes, they're uh, they're they're with a, a special uh, gravy, and they. Um, you, you know, they're like a, yeah. almost like a turkey barbecue well, without well, it's not, not tomato based. But anyway, but we went through two of those and then ran out of food and had to get more. I think the last year we sent people to the grocery store to pick up more stuff to have as hors d'oeuvres because we ran out. I see. All right. Well, um. So the next place to normally cast off from here is, uh, and I'll leave this one to you. I have my own roundabout thought on this, but what is this movie about? This movie is about taking, or well, it's a couple of different things. One is is uh, learning how to appreciate and get the most out of every day you can. And the other is, to always strive to be better so that each day is the best it can be. Honestly, your description is a little bit better than mine. Mine more is a summary of the premise. So essentially, what if there was no tomorrow or rather, what if there were infinite yesterdays? I mean, well, what did you summary learn? of it? Yeah. What did you learn from today that what you can use to make tomorrow better? I mean, I, in essence, I made a commitment after I watched this again, because I hadn't watched it all the way through in a few years. 
was yeah. is to make each day, try to make it the best day I possibly could. Find the best things, enjoy it, take every day, savor every moment, um, and, and, and enjoy every bit of life I have. So I do find myself thinking uh, a lot of different aspects of this. So number one, you know, the notion of the film, um, uh, or at least the plot summary, a cynical TV weatherman finds himself reliving the same day over and over again when he goes on location to the small town of Punxsutawney to film a report about their annual Groundhog Day. His predicament drives him to distraction until he sees a way of turning the situation to his advantage. I see a lot of... Um, similarities to Dickens in this, in that um, this reminds me a lot of a, a different version of A Christmas Carol, but one that's a little bit more rooted in um, Eastern philosophy, but it has elements of purgatory. <laughs> so what I mean by that is, is he's stuck in this infinite loop of the same day happening over and over and we'll get into you know the question of how long was he stuck there at some point here at probably towards the end of this but um ultimately um in addressing something that you know harold ramus uh discussing the film after the fact basically took it from the tenant or the um, um tenet of um buddhism that you know you live your uh, best life and you have to continually um, try and ascend to the next plane of humanity or um, your next self and that it takes endless amounts of time it takes entire lifetimes to earn your way up to the next degree of uh, humanity essentially and in through this you know odd scenario um, Phil Connors ends up living basically an entire lifetime within the span of one day, just repeatedly. Until he eventually ascends to his final, you know, um, better life. He basically is reincarnated on a daily basis. Yes. So, um, I don't know, did you have any other themes that you wanted to pull in on this? Um, there were, there were so many subtle points, for instance, when something would go right, you know, and he would try to build on it, he would try to recreate it and he would force it. And every time he did, it got worse and worse and worse. You're Which specifically exactly. referring to like the the repeated date over and over and over that eventually right. ends with him getting slapped. Yes, it, it started out. It, he got close to, you know, or reaching nirvana, and then each day afterwards, it got further and further along the line when she slaps him because she just looks like it. He acts like an idiot. So. And I guess that's just a lesson for those who try to relive moments. You really can't relive moments, but you can build upon moments and you can remember moments. But moments like that have to have some natural flow. They ju You can't force them. So that's a subtle point that was made in this film. Um, the fact that... Um, uh, you know, you you have an enlightenment, you know, from everything from um, him finally noticing the old uh, beggar on the street corner to um, uh, helping the, the old ladies with uh, their flat tire. He had to build on each thing um, and stuff that he didn't notice before. Suddenly now he notices and takes action for. So... That he takes responsibility over not only his own self, but, you know, naturally caring about everybody else. And that's kind of where I was going a little bit with the Dickensian um, point of view is that the whole point of A Christmas Carol is 
um, Scrooge to save himself have to, has to start caring about other people. And for a guy that starts off the movie basically hating everyone and everything, he's incredibly cynical about everything that's going on. Um, he has to evolve severely in order to be something completely different. Yes. And obviously that takes a shock of that. This is a much more gradual thing than, you know, Scrooge through the course of a night um, being visited by ghosts and, um, you know, realizing the errors of his ways and um, undoing, you know, however much his lifetime had been to that point. But equally, I think that you arrive at the same point. Or the same ending stop, let's say. Sure. All right, so... We'll get into uh, a few of the things here. Uh, best performance for you? Uh, Bill Murray himself. So I think he uh, did a very good job um, going from being more cynical to being much more caring and, um, you know, it didn't come across as being, I mean, the subtlety of the change was was there. Yeah, I can buy that. Um, for me, the I put down um, Danny Rubin and Harold Ramis, um, the specific writers of the film. Um, you know, Rubin came up with the original story. They ended up readapting the screenplay, a couple of different versions of it, and then Ramis carrying out the vision. But this is such a novel film that um, I honestly think that the, the thing... Yeah, it probably doesn't work as well um, if you don't have somebody of Murray's comedic ability, but it could potentially uh, have worked in a different fashion. Um, the real heart of this and the, the genius of the entire piece, to me, has always been the premise and then the execution as they keep coming about. Because I think the premise, more than anything else, is what's been copied and, you know, makes for this as a somewhat pop cultural um, element. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess. I, I, I can see there are a few other people who could have done the film, I think, that would have done okay. But, um... I mean, notably, uh, they tried to get both Michael Keaton and Tom Hanks to do the lead role. And then settled on Bill Murray. So it's not like he was even necessarily the first choice. But I, I do agree that the, you couldn't really see anybody else in the role at a certain point. I can actually see Michael Keaton doing this. See, I'm not as familiar with Keaton's like more um, comedic work. Maybe where at where he was at in the '90s, that would have made sense. But he's coming off of both Batman films, and I don't know if that makes as much sense for him. Whereas Murray, this is completely within character for everything he'd done to this point. Yeah. So, um, all right. Uh, best minor performance. Um, well, this is where I'm going to have to put a dagger in my wife's heart. Chris Elliott. <laughs> uh, for the listening audience, you will not know or understand how much my mother hates Chris Elliott and thinks he's creepy. Honestly, I, I wish if I ever got to the point that I, um, was able to be like friends with Chris Elliott or something that I would, like, invite him to her birthday party one of these years, just so that it would be so awkward. Oh, and if he would be, he'd be the type that would, if you told him that, he would play it up. <laughs> oh, I know, I'm sure. He'd just, it, he'd just make it really obnoxious and, and uncomfortable for her. He'd think it was hilarious. So, but see, I grew up, I grew up in the age where my dad uh, loved Chris Elliott's father and his partner. Um, they were a radio comedy team called Ray and Bob and Ray. Ray Gould and Bob Elliott. And uh, um, 
you know, they had very bizarre senses of humor to begin with. I mean, they did a bit called the slow talkers of America where he goes, you know, hi, uh, Ray Gould would go, um, well, we're interviewing Mr. So-and-so of slow talkers of America. Tell us a little bit about your organization. Well, we talk really slowly. And they carry this bit out for like 10 minutes doing that. And you'd think it's the stupidest thing in the world until you watch it and you get to about about uh, six or seven minutes. Then every time he does it, you're just busting. And, you know, but Chris Elliott grew up in this environment. And so he's always had this bizarre sense of humor. And um, uh, your uh, your mother's first indoctrination was he did a show called the Chris, or, or, uh, Chris Elliott show or something like that on Fox after the Simpsons. And in there, he was a, a man child who was living in the garage over his parents' basement or, um, uh, uh, or uh, apartment over his parents' garage. And Bob Elliott, his dad, played his father on the show, who was just annoyed by him. And your mother, for whatever reason, took an instant dislike of him and just could not stand him and thought he was horrible. So why do you nominate him, though, for this? Because he plays the part, you know, he's 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 obnoxious, he's sleazy. He's, but he's yet somewhat sympathetic about, you know, the, the fact of what he is and the way he portrays himself right down to trying to impress the girl. So he puts a tip on the bar and then takes half of it back when she walks away. I mean, that just summarizes it. There aren't too many comedians or, or actors who could get away with being that combination of obnoxious, sleazy, and... Um, somewhat sympathetic as being just a, a, a dork. Um, you know, uh, the scene where he's auctioning himself and the way he twirls himself around to try to, you know, get somebody to, to bid on him. And he ends up going for, was it four bits, 50 cents? I think it was two, so, but... Two bits is a quarter. I know. All right. Well, anyway... So, all right, only because, um, so, all right, I'll give, I have two nominees for this. Um, first off, Robin Duke, who plays Doris, I just, I don't know, I enjoyed her character, and she seems to come about in certain ways throughout the movie and pops up in the least expected spot, but seems to just have a certain charismatic way of breaking through in whatever scene she is um, just from watching it. But two, how the hell did you not go with literally the most quoted minor character we've talked about for 20 we years? We have gotten to that yet, have we? Ned. We are, we are, Steven we are, Tobolowsky, who we has are, championed we that are, film. We are too early. We are jumping the gun. We're not jumping the gun at all. This yes, is my are. nominee. Ned Ryerson, Stephen Tobolowski, you get my best minor performance nominee. Okay, good. Good for you. <sighs> Should we go on to the most char- charismatic? Yes, I have Bill Murray. Now you may go. Stephen Tobolowski. <laughs> How because is Stephen Tobolowski most charismatic? Because, yes, he is. Because the minute he's on the screen, your eyes are riveted to him because he is so over the top. You can't look away. He is a train wreck. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> His character alone just... Uh, I, there, I mean, there, setback, there are a few minor... Insurance agents... Uh, insurance agencies for decades. 
I, I, Whole generations of young men and women decided not to go into insurance because of Stephen Tobolowsky. Ned Ryerson! Needle nose Ned, Ned in the head. Hey, buddy, don't tell me you don't remember me because I sure as heck remember you. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? And then even his, like, weird laugh that his guttural thing. (laughs) Yeah. God. I mean, watch that first step. It's a doozy. I mean, just every piece of this. Oh, I, I remember he was on one of the podcasts I used to listen to. Uh, talking about another film called, like, Happy Death Day from a few years ago, which was basically a ripoff of the same premise, but it was a horror film. She has to figure out who the killer is, and that's un- until that happens, she keeps repeating the same day over and over. But, like, how much he goes to bat for this film yet and, like, is one of the key champions, especially now that Ramus is dead. Like, I know it caused kind of the rift with him and Murray, and so Murray doesn't really um, look on this one as fondly, but my goodness. Yeah. So, all right. I had Bill Murray as my most charismatic. I don't think I need to go into that a whole lot. It's it's pretty self-explanatory if you watch the movie. All right, best scenes. Nominees. Nancy Taylor... From 12th grade English? Uh, Stealing the money, then buying a Desperado costume. I'm watching that yesterday, and Sarah's just busting it when he shows up in the Desperado costume. Uh, (laughs) Driving down the train tracks, and then just miraculously pulling off. Also, there was a cop car following them, and then, like, we get no mention of the fact that, like, the train... Barely misses hitting them. Did it plow through a cop car? Like, that's just not part of the film. It doesn't end up tracking, but that's beside the point. Um, Replaying the same date over and over, ending with a slap. We already talked about that one. Uh, I am a god, Rita. And then finally, helping everybody in town. Kind of that ending sequence where he starts doing, like, ice sculpting and um, jacking up an old lady's car, saving his uh, brother Brian Doyle Murray from choking on his steak. Buster. Yes. So, did you have any others you wanted to add to this? Um, I, you know, he's eating all the food and smoking like a banshee at the breakfast table. You know, don't you worry about love handles? And that's where the whole, well, I'm a god, comes in. No, uh, different uh, part of the movie. Second, uh, different part? Okay. He has but, like three uh, or four different conversations in that diner at different periods of time. So it's hard to always figure out which one it is. So, and by the way, did you happen to notice who was playing the part of the kid who was yes. supposed to be getting married? Yes, I've seen that like the last four or five times I've seen it. It's a very, very young Michael Shannon. Yeah. And of course, Michael Shannon has to be in an oddly premised movie. That's, that's well, just yeah. save for the man of steel, which um, even by some of the comic book standards is still a different premise and a different take. He just can't be in a normal movie. Yeah. Well, Yeah. Although being in the shape of water, I would I will still comment it was the best uh, oh, God. comedy, I, the best uh, romantic uh, film involving a fish that I have ever seen. Thanks for that. Yes. I'm so glad that you wanted to throw that one into the middle of the Groundhog Day episode. Oh, we're talking about Michael Shannon, so I can get that. <sighs> okay. All right, so who wins, or which scene wins it for you? Um, the ending, because it just, it's the payoff. Like the very, very end, or that whole, like, that last whole day sequence? That montage, where there, he's going through his whole day. He's up playing the piano. He's up, um, he's up, 
you know, he's he's catches the kid falling out of the tree. All right. So then what takes the uh, cake for your favorite scene? Um, anyone with Stephen Trobolowski, because the one where he really is going berserk there because he's, you know, and he comes up uh, or uh, and he's like uh, just hauls off and belts him. <laughs> Docks him out. That one is that one's classic. But any of those scenes where he's coming up, they're just so good. I don't know why um, that I like it so much as I do, but it kicks off that final part of the movie, um, and it just seems to work well within the sequence. Is Phil deciding he's going to learn to play piano? Yeah. It, it's really where he starts to make all those major improvements. He's sitting in the diner. He's reading poetry. He hears a song on the uh, radio or some classical music, decides he wants to learn to play piano in order to, like, go through this whole notion of self-improvement. And that's kind of the kickoff that, like, really where he's made that final change, that final uh, evolution toward what he needs to be in order to stop the loop. Yeah. All right. Most indelible moment. Um, I really, it, it, it would probably be the moment in time where he realizes he is stuck. And when he's stuck, instead of becoming angry and, um, you know, depressed about it. He does just the opposite, which is he makes the decision that he's going to try to make the best of it and try to make himself better. That to me is an indelible moment because I think that's really, I mean, a lot of people. Uh, it's, okay. It's, it's, Hold it's, on. Where, where in the movie do you place him? trying to like just simply be better i mean there, there's such a gradual evolution to this movie in the same way that he is i don't know if there's any one point i could i could say that he's just made this turn he, he has all right he is there's a point and i'm trying to remember how to or how where exactly it was but i could tell it's like he came to the conclusion that Nothing was going to change until he did. And it was like right after the whole scenes with the face slapping over and over again. And then he started down the path of trying to, um, you know, learn to play the piano. And he became cognizant of the old guy, the old bum on the street. And you just. That's after he starts all the run of suicides because he starts to give up. Yeah. Yeah. It's after that, and he finally, he comes to that conclusion that everything is where it is, and, you know, and he decides he's going to make this change. So Okay. Mine is a much simpler version of this. It's the groundhog driving the truck. I mean, it was made okay. into a damn Super Bowl commercial. Okay. I mean, he lets the stupid groundhog. He's going to kill the groundhog and himself, and he lets the stupid thing drive the truck. Yeah. I mean, it's just one of the better moments in the movie. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Do you want to take a break before we get into the lines? Uh, sure. Sure. All right, uh, we'll just take a quick pause for, for uh, everybody at home, and we'll be right back. And we're back. All right, so uh, moving on to best lines. Comedy movies always have some of the best lines, so at least this week you can't bitch at me about the fact, well, this isn't a really quotable movie. Yeah, I know. That's kind of the situation that you always go through with with more serious films is trying to find the most quotable lines or the funniest lines, but there were several in this film and it was hard to pick. So these are the ones that I picked out. You can add to them if you'd like. 
This is the one time where television really fails to capture the true excitement of a large squirrel predicting the weather. I love that one. It's just so damn cynical. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's, of course, for me, there's always the summation line. Well, what if there is no tomorrow? There wasn't one today. Uh, of course, one of the most repeated quotes throughout the whole thing. Okay, campers, rise and shine. And don't forget your booties because it's cold out there. It's cold out there every day. It's Groundhog Day. You want a prediction about the weather? You're asking the wrong Phil. I'm going to give you a prediction about this winter. It's going to be cold. It's going to be dark. And it's going to last you for the rest of your lives. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what every every single uh, winter feels like, especially around February. All right. Next I one. Love, I, uh, all right. Well, one I want to throw out is... is what would you do if you were stuck in one place and every day exactly the same and nothing you did mattered? Ralph, the, the that sums yes. it up for me. Yes, that was my last one. The other one was the, the line immediately preceding it. I was in the Virgin Islands once. I met a girl. We ate lobster, drank pina coladas. At sunset, we made love like sea otters. That was a pretty good day. Why couldn't I get that day over and over and over? <laughs> yeah. All right. So which one does it for you? Well, I, I do like the, the the same day over and over and over. As we are now, I am now personally celebrating day 56 of my quarantine <sighs> so it's beginning to feel it's, that it's not showing at all yeah all right uh honorable mention um ned ned ryerson neil knows ned ned the head ned <laughs> i mean that's just so great you can start quoting that line, and almost everybody will immediately know what film it's from. I don't know if that's true. I don't think enough people know this movie, to be quite honest. Uh, if they don't, they're really missing out. All right, so uh, that brings us to funniest line. Which one do you have for that? The the uh, failure to cat or uh, capture, um, you know, the true essence of uh, of a large squirrel predicting the weather. Uh, yeah, I can agree on that one certainly. It's just it so summarizes Bill Murray's character for the first two thirds of the film. I mean, he's just so like. And dry about the whole thing. That is just hilarious. There was a time before I was married that I used to say things like that constantly. What do you it's mean? The... Before you were married, you still well, do I'm... that on a regular basis. I'm much less now than I was. I was much, much more <laughs> cynical than I am now. If you can believe that. I can't, because you've gotten more cynical with age. In certain regards, but no, I was much more. Add to that being a pompous ass. and uh, Well, you do that role very well. You're welcome. <laughs> do something, you might as well do it well. I suppose that's true. All right. That takes us into the categories. Um, or the uh, grading uh, scale here. 
Um, just before that, I do want to say that this is uh, recognized by the AFI on their uh, 100 Years 100 Laughs list uh, at number 34. I don't honestly know if there are 33 better comedy movies. I I, I don't understand how this is only 34. Um, but it was uh, their number eight fantasy film. It is also uh, part of the National Film Registry. So, But then again... Um, you just have to be part of the public consciousness to basically be a part of the National Film Registry. So, well, the the difference is, and I, why it's probably down the road or down the thing is how they developed it. If they're looking at funniest films based on within the context of when the film was, as opposed to how it's held up today, you're going to have to put several other films in there. You're going to put uh, a few of the Charlie Chaplin films in there. You're going to put uh, a, a few of the Marx Brothers films in there. You're going to have yes, to. Add, those are all held up much higher. To, yeah, you're going to have to add Lou or uh, Abbott and Costello and their original couple of few films like um, Buck Privates and stuff like that, that were some of their early ones. The very early Martin and Lewis films. So, and then okay. you've got. Then you've got all of the Bob Hope and Bing Crosby road pictures. So there, I can see where it is, all right, and why. It's got a lot of competition. And I think you're just not seeing it because you have a less, you have a more narrow view of it because you haven't been around as long as I hadn't been, I have been, and have been exposed to as many different areas of comedy and comic film. Honestly, comedy is extremely relative for me to begin with, so whatever. Well, I, I, I have a hard time with things I view as dated comedy. A film we will eventually review is going to be rather excruciating for me, Animal House. And um, we're naming a crap ton of films that were well before that. Yeah, I understand. But, you know, you can, you can, you can watch a film... For instance, um, Duck Soup by the Marx Brothers. It doesn't hold up the comedy that well. It's not like you're rolling in the aisle. But you can appreciate for its time, it was it was like really cutting edge. You know, but I mean, it's it, you know, there's a lot of things that were written in, into that that uh, movie. It was based on a Marx Brothers play on Broadway. Um, but, you know, for instance, uh, the whole line, the other day I shot a man in, or, a li- or a tiger in my pajamas. What he was doing in my pajamas, I'll never know. Um, you know, that kind of comedy look line was not, you know, that entente was not a, or something prevalent in society until the Marx Brothers started doing that stuff. Well, we'll save that for when we actually get that. Or get to that point. So, all right. Um, without further ado, the grading. Uh, so, what did you have down for legacy? Um, it's indelible and it's novel, and I think it really set a mark for anything similar to it. Uh, I'm I'm would say seven to eight. You got to lock in on a number. All right. Um, eight. All right. So that's what I had to, um, I've, I had it at a seven and a half. I'm going to say eight. And it's just because the premise of this has been copied in a lot of, um, pop, or pop culture spheres. I, I've seen it in, um, several different shows where like they do an episode and they kind of repeat this element. Um, or everybody's got to have their take on it. I already talked to you that they kind of copied it with that horror film from a couple of years ago. Um, I, I do see, I, I don't know if this is top of mind comedy um, when people think of stuff, but comedy gets rolled so quickly as far as humor and the jokes and how things kind of go along that it's hard for anything to dis- sustain a long-term legacy. I mean, even for my generation, that um, one of the signature or like probably the two signature comedies of my high school era, Anchorman and Superbad, are already uh, respectively, I believe, um, 
uh, 16 and 13 years old. Yeah. So, like, and at a certain point, it just ages out. And it just doesn't become as funny. I, I know for some people, like, um, you kind of hold the same impression of the first time you saw it. But, and, and you're kind of reliving the comedy. It's just that anybody presented to it new or modern probably isn't going to feel the same way. So, um, what did you have for impact significance? I had an eight. Okay. I had it as seven and a half. Um, again, I think that this has, um, some significance, but I don't think it was necessarily revelatory. You would have a little bit more notion of this than I would, but like, um, this wasn't a celebrated comedy from what I'm, I'm seeing at the time. Like it was popular, but it wasn't like, you know, this is one of the great things. This is one of those films that has had more life, you know, stronger legs after it was released than when it was released. Well, I think it's an it's a part of the cable generation. I mean, this is um, we were talking about this when I uh, did the uh, Pulp Fiction episode with Phil a few days ago, but um, Pulp Fiction and um Shawshank Redemption and some of these other films they kind of get a second life by being on cable all the time and people seeing them that way Apollo 13 for you is that way um there are just certain movies from the 90s that got such replay because people um saw them in their homes and I I wonder to a certain extent with the availability of stuff whether we're going to end up having some of that kind of come around with the whole streaming era um, and certain films, but it, it'll be interesting to see if there's anything that gets like a better second life and that doesn't live up to the same reputation as it was when it first came out. And I think that's part of the point of why we have that five year embargo, uh, on anything more modern so that we can give it a real, uh, good look or a long tail. So you're going to have that. And as mediums change, it changes. I've said all along, <clears throat> the best thing that happened to the Beatles was technology. It wasn't the music. Because you look at the Beatles. They sold in vinyl. Then they sold in 8-track. Then they sold in cassette. Then they sold in CD. Then they sold in MP3. And now they're streaming. So you've got multiple things. I know for a fact I've got albums from the Beatles, from the Eagles, from Genesis that I owned in all one of or in all of those various uh, formats at some point in time. So I've bought the same music in five different ways. And I think that's where you're going to see this starting to happen and why you're going to see certain things come back and get new life because as the mediums change, um, it it ha people have a tendency to start with an unfamiliar platform by going to something or things that they're more f uh, familiar with. Okay, I, I guess I don't understand the point necessarily. the The point you're seemingly making is is um, that it made them more money, not necessarily that it gained them a new audience. Both it does both because what I'm saying is is that um, the more often and you you see this, you know, oh what hey Joe, what did you do this weekend? I watched um, Groundhog Day again. Oh, I've never seen that film. I says, well, it's on Netflix right now. And, you know, that's what you're going to see because people will gravitate to things and that's how it will work is they get a new format. It comes back up. They watch it again. They start talking to their friends and that's where the new audience starts to develop. All right. I mean, I guess I'd buy that a little bit more as an explanation. So uh, what did you have down for novelty? Um, nine. I've never seen anything like it there or anything done as well since. I've seen it, you know, kind of spoofed in uh, skits and movies and stuff, but never anything to the extent that this movie did it. I had it in a nine and a half, and it's simply because there are no comedies exploring such high concept philosophical concepts, but make them simple enough for people to get and translate it well that's incredibly entertaining um 
there's literally nothing like this. I don't care whether it's an, any other um, Bill Murray comedy movie or whatever else. I mean, I feel somewhat similar to how Go- Ghostbusters is because it's um, kind of a genre matchup or mashup, and it's dealing with things like the occult and other pieces, but it's not handling such high-level philosophical concepts as purgatory or reincarnation or existentialism. And it, they do it all without like being in your face about it. They yeah. just present the questions and it's so well written and edited and it's tight. And there doesn't honestly for being a two hour movie, it doesn't really feel like two hours. No. And that at one point in time, did I ever feel like, uh, um, where are we on this? How much was left? And I can't say that for many films because at some point there's some there's there's a point where almost every film drags a little bit. Yeah, I don't remember this film dragging. The only other film that I felt never dragged once, other than this film, was a film about not far off from this time frame, and that was um, The Fugitive. That's why I was still considered The Fugitive one of the best edited films of all time because there isn't a moment that it seems to drag. I have a few less um, complaints on some movies. There are a few where uh, I can sit and watch it endlessly and it it's never going to have a problem for me with some of that. The, the original remake of um, uh, Ocean's Eleven with Clooney and Damon and Pitt and all of them, I, I honestly can watch that and never have a uh, an issue with time. Um, the original Star Wars does that for me, but um, similarly, uh, I, I would agree on the concept. There are a lot of films that just have a drag point and just become a little bit too long, but you know, that's, that's for maybe another time. All right. So what did you have for classicness? Uh, again, a nine. Uh, so I had a 9.5. So I'm actually a little bit, I, I don't know. This is becoming a weird thing for me where I'm actually, uh, higher on certain films than, uh, most, but, um, it's gonna take a it's gonna take a uh, a near act of God to give me to give anything a ten on any category. I mean, I, can I know. Tell right now, I think we've given one ten. ten. Classicness to get a ten from me. I can think of probably three films that will have a classicness ten off the top of my head. So, and that's about it. Boy, I'm. I, Casablanca, yeah, or I mean, uh, Citizen Kane and Rear no. Wind. Citizen Kane is incredibly dated. The whole concept of it is, is he's a newspaper uh, magnet. Just in the the character himself, it doesn't relate. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I, you and I are going to disagree up and down on Citizen Kane, but um, no. No, no, no. No, there there are a few that, like, classicness that are just picture perfect and haven't aged poorly at all. And I don't know. Casablanca, I can agree with. I think The Godfather is probably one of them. Um, I mean, even Star Wars. Like, the tech has aged so poorly at times in some of that that it, it's... <sighs> but anyway, I digress. That's one of the reasons why I think Rear Window, because the only thing that's changed out of Rear Window is that now instead of just having a pair of binoculars, you have all kinds of extra su- surveillance equipment that you can utilize. Yeah, I know. So, um, all right, rewatchability. Um, nine and a half. So I went nine. So... <laughs> We're, we're pretty standard on most of these. I don't know if this is one that uh, I'm often coming back to or like find myself that it's a rainy day or, oh, this is on. I'm going to I'm going to rewatch it. But it is one that I've rewatched enough times that um, it, it's comfortably at a, a nine for me. Well, and this is my standard that I I thought about this. What is rewatchability? 
okay, it's one thing to sit and rewatch a film. Here's the other, okay? Um, say it's uh, a given day and I'm watching a, a Brewer baseball game and the game gets over at 10.15 and I'm not quite ready for bed. I'm flipping the stations around and all of a sudden I see here's Groundhog Day and I'll sit and watch it for 15, 20 minutes and get a chuckle uh, or whatever before I head to bed. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. I, it's a it's um, a helicopter film watching where you just drop in w- for a few minutes and then you take off again. All right, so add in the 8.8 audience score. Uh, it only got an 88% from the audience. This is actually, um, this is one where the critics and the uh, fans um, diverged quite a bit. Um, I think it has a 96% critic score. It has an 88% for the audience score. So I'm not sure who really is not buying into this film, but okay. So I that, uh, don't understand it. Well, that's possible. And I, I don't know, maybe they don't find some of the like sarcasm and such as funny as maybe you and I do, but, uh, but that actually puts it at a 52.3 overall score for the evening. Um, so, uh, that actually puts it as our number two film behind Pulp Fiction. Wow. So it's currently on top of, um, Apocalypse Now, Raiders, which I think we might be revisiting at some point, Goodfellas, um, and some of the other, like, really classic films. Yeah, that's, that is a good point, I guess, um. But when it, but it is very subjective. And thinking back, you know, if I look at the list of films we've reviewed, I would say this is one of near the top of where that list is of films I enjoyed. Well, I I think this is this is where the crux of the matter is. We kind of created this because um, we felt that certain movies were not getting their due um, by a particular standard of like comedies are never recognized during the year that they are actually made very rarely, you know, with any awards recognition or anything else. There are very few comedies that ever get nominated for anything, but that comedies in the cultural lexicon and how we understand things, especially more recently where like stand up comedians and such have gotten such a powerful, uh, angle on everything in that a area where everything seems stranger than fiction some days. Um, you know, I, I do think that there is place for musicals and horror films to get a little bit better nudge than some of the basic um, genre lists. I mean, again, this is an extremely novel film, by my opinion, of something that's not only entertaining, but um, extremely thought-provoking and philosophical. Like, placing yourself in Phil Connors' shoes. I don't know how, if I could have survived that. Not that I would have had a choice because he tries to kill himself I don't know how many times and never really truly succeeds, but he just has to eventually evolve. And you would think that over the course of, you know, a thousand lifetimes, essentially, that you might get to the same place, but you're dealing with that level of high concept in something that's extremely entertaining. So ultimately, uh, did you have any other remaining questions from the film? No, I, I really didn't. Um, the really, it, it, it all comes together. It all makes sense. It, it really, you know, this is in uh, this is close to, uh, um, and I've only read parts of the book and seen parts of the film, but the the secret life of Walter Mitty, you know, that type of concept. It's again, or uh, you know, the the uh, the um, whole concept of uh, uh, British play, or the Irish playwright. Um, the importance of being earnest. Uh, oh, I don't, I don't know who you're talking about, but yeah, I know and, the play. 
Yeah. Um, you know, men live quiet lives of desperation. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. You know, every day is the same. I, I can tell you. That well, I that's that. that goes back even further to like Arthur Miller, death yeah. of a salesman. Uh no, that uh, no, the the uh, that go before that for that that quote. So, um, it comes from Oscar Wilde. Oh, okay. So, all right. So, a uh, few remaining questions that I had about the movie. So there's been a lot of um, post-discussion of how long they estimate Phil was actually stuck in the loop. Um, by some people in the studio's recounting of certain activities and other things, they have estimated this is the more official version, that he was stuck for something close to like 34 years, repeating the same day. Now, in post-interviews, Harold Ramis seemed to think that it was closer to, like, a thousand years. But... Uh, um, I doubt that. Because, I mean, you, you have to stop and think. He went from not having any knowledge of how to, to uh, play the piano to being able to play jazz piano. Yes. All right. And that in and of itself is daily practice for 10, 15 years. Yeah. So, I, you know, that's... Well, but then add in he's got to learn French in order to, like, understand and read French poetry. And he's got to take on all of these other things. The amount of times that he probably killed himself. Uh, you know, you're, you're getting certain estimates... And I, I don't, or I, the 34 years thing probably is not terribly far off. Mm. I, I don't, you know, that, that's hard for me to even fathom that somebody could be stuck in that type of loop. But ultimately, I mean, it is, once you start doing some of the math, it makes sense. So, um, I, I guess it does. I, it does seem like an awfully long time. Now, I asked you this, like, I don't remember, one of the times after we'd watched this, but and it's never completely specified exactly what is it that gets him out of the loop? He achieved uh, the ultimate... He became the person that he needed to be in order to be loved. Boy, I mean, if you've got to go through all of that and, like, be the exemplary human in order to be just loved. Also, the the course of ba basically getting someone to fall in love with you over the course of one single day seems a little ludicrous to me, but okay, that's why whenever he kept trying to force it, it, it didn't make sense because um, some of those things have a natural binge to them that are weeks or months or whatever else. I don't know. It, it's just, it's something that sticks a little bit in my craw as far as that for an otherwise um, extremely well-written movie. But And finally, how many ways and how many times did he actually kill himself? Like, I mean, we've, we've only been, uh, I think they only do like four or five different versions within the movie, but even then he has that conversation where I'm God and he starts describing some of the other ways in which he's like died or, uh, tried to commit suicide or, you know, he talks about being shot, which isn't pictured in the movie burned, which isn't exactly in the movie, unless you want to count like when they blow up. Um, the truck by driving off into the quarry. Yeah, I, I would say that there's probably more than a few times. Is it? It it had to. He had to reach a point where he had to give up because it wasn't going to help. Well, and it makes sense. Any of us in that situation, 
would like resort to this at some point during the course of anything else because uh you know the notion of living in perfection or like being able to do whatever you want loses its shine he goes through such ebbs and natural ebbs and flows throughout the course of the movie i i don't know i i would have a struggle with from a day-to-day perspective anything that um some of those days why would you even get out of bed (laughs) so uh that's all i had for that though any other remaining thoughts or questions on this one no, not really. I would encourage those who have not seen it or haven't seen it in some time to go out and watch it because I really think that once people watch it again, it they realize how good a film this really is. I mean, this has been on Netflix for quite some time at this point, so it's uh, it, it's available. It's all there for you, folks. So um, I I can't do too much else. We've been trying to plug most of these films for a while now so uh anyway uh that's going to do it i wish we had more time but i'm expecting a friend for dinner Uh, Thank you to everybody who has uh, been listening to the show. Um, We're getting um, quite a a different audience from uh, all over the world at this point, and we're just thrilled to continue to do the show. And um, I know, at least for myself, this has been an enjoyable uh, thing to do weekly. Um, We're um, hopefully going to be doing this for quite a while. So, um, you know, if you have any uh, questions, comments, or concerns about the show, um, you can reach out to us. Um, we're looking for uh, potential guest stars or guest hosts. Um, if you have any like complaints about you know one of the gradings that we did, we'd be happy to uh, talk about it or anything else and um, just possibly grow the audience. So um, like we've said before, uh, you could reach out to us Twitter. Um, we each have uh, different emails. Um, that we've said on the podcast before. Um, but uh, we, we're glad to have everybody, and um, we'll see you again next week. <laughs>